Welcome to lecture 22 for AC 1002. This is the uh, final lecture and completes the services section. So we'll be looking at some of the things that we um, covered in the previous lecture in a little bit more detail. So in the last lecture we talked about um, how on-grid and off-grid services were um, slightly different. This lecture will look at how some of the specifics of those systems and how they might be incorporated into a domestic house. So from the last lecture we discovered that we needed heating and hot water, uh, electrical systems, water supplies and drainage. So we'll go through some of these systems and look at some of the, the specifics of um, how they might be put in place, what the, what the construction is behind them. So we'll cover heating first. So regardless of what type of uh, fuel you're using, um, most houses have a, a wet heating system. Um, and that means that there's, there's water moving about the system going into radiators and, or underfloor heating. Um, and regardless of whether it's, it's gas or oil that you're, you're burning, these systems tend to work in the same way. So if we look at the heating side of this, we have a, a, usually a combined system that gives you heating and hot water. The heating system, we've got our, uh, in this point here, we've got our gas main, but that could be an oil line coming in at the bottom corner to a, a boiler and then a, a series of radiators. So the fuel's burnt in the boiler and uh, that indirectly heats hot water. Um, which is then moved around uh, a network of pipes by a pump. So the pump, the little uh, orange dot there, um, is the thing that pressurizes the system and moves it, um, moves it around. We've got a motorized valve, which is the, the red bow tie, and that turns on and off the, uh, the system. So it can stop the pipe from, from flowing or it can allow it to flow and uh, that's usually operated by a time clock, the, the sort of thing you have on the wall in the kitchen that tells the, the heating when to turn on. And uh, when that's open, there's a pipe that flows right the way around the system, all the way through the house and back to the boiler. And off of that, there are uh, radiators or um, could be underfloor heating systems um, for each room. And into each room we have a uh, if there's a radiator, we usually have a thermostatic valve attached to the flow side of the radiator. So that's the side that the water's coming from, it's coming from the boiler. Um, and that allows you to control the amount of water going into each radiator. So the thermostatic element of it, um, if we dial that to, uh, to two, that uh, recognizes that there's gonna be a certain amount of heat within the, the room and it will turn off the flow when it gets to that low level of heat, a higher level, um, it'll let more heat through before the, the thermostat turns it off. Um, if it's entirely off, there's no hot water that can flow into the radiators, therefore the radiators will get cold um, and there, there'll be no heat. If we look at the hot water side of that system now, we've got our boiler and again it's the pump that that pressurizes it and we have a motorized valve and a cylinder and a return back to the, uh, the boiler. So the pump maintains the pressure of the system and controls the, the flow within the system. It's pushing the hot water around the, around the mains pipes and it then passes through the motorized valve which again is open opened by the time clock. So usually there's two settings on a, a time clock which is one for hot water and one for heating. And it uh, then moves into the hot water cylinder and heats the water by means of an indirect loop before returning back round to the boiler to be reheated again. And the way that most indirect cylinders work is they, they're not heating the water that you would get out of the tap um, directly. The boiler isn't boiling that water and then coming through. It's heating it to a much higher temperature and that would be unsafe for you to, to just put that water out of the tap. Um, Instead, 
there's a cylinder which is fed from fed with cold water and there's a loop of a uh, pipework within that that the water from the boiler flows round and exchanges the heat into the hot water in the in the cylinder which then uh, in, in turn heats that and you can open up your tap and get hot water an alternative method of heating a, a building is by using a, a heat pump and this can be a ground source heat pump or a, an air source heat pump so we'll look at ground source heat pump first and generally what that means is we have somewhere within the, the, the property uh, a large area surface area of uh, pipes that are laid within the, the ground and there's a, a fluid which is usually water with with a, an antifreeze or an additive into it and that's pumped around the system and that gathers a small amount of residual heat so this can be heat from the ground um, which is a, kind of effectively solar radiation that's heated the ground at some point and uh, it can gather that up and put it back into the system where it can be exchanged so the same as the the indirect hot water cylinder we can um, have a ground source heat pump which uses heat exchangers so it takes um, hot uh, sorry it takes low temperature water uh, or fluid from the, the ground and can exchange that with with a, a compressible uh, gas or fluid and um, exchange that heat so that it can then be used within within a system. So what heat pumps do is they work by gathering small amounts of heat from the ground or air and they compress it to provide a higher temperature. So we're taking a, a small amount of heat over a large area and we're changing it into a large amount of heat over a small area. And this so it's similar to the way that a refrigerator runs in reverse rather than removing heat from the refrigerator and putting it out the back we're, we're kind of doing that in opposite so the the blue side of this is the um the loop running through the, the the first heat exchanger which is the evaporator and then it uh, is compressed and uh, runs through a second heat exchanger which is the condenser where it then exchanges its heat with the system within the house and then it goes back out through the expansion valve because it's a compressed fluid at that point and uh, it works its way back around the system. So moving on to electrical systems within a house. A typical electrical system within a, within a house has a number of different um, ring circuits or circuits within it and they're all fed off uh, a thing called the, the consumer unit, it used to be called the fuse box. Um, so at the top corner here we have um, our, uh, our power coming in at this point. So we've got our, our meter so we can find out how much power we're using. And that then goes into this fuse box and then is distributed out amongst all the, the, the various systems. And the reason that we have different systems is so that we can either isolate them or that they require different amounts of uh, ampage. So for instance, uh, a cooker would be a single 32 amp um, system going back to its own fuse within the, the fuse box. We need uh, a lower ampage for a light circuit and we can either run um, electrical power for sockets either as a ring circuit so that is where um, we're, we're running round and these things are dealt with um, as, a, as a ring or they can radiate out from from one uh, socket with a number of branches and if we look at a typical consumer unit um, what we have is usually a plastic box with with a number of switches and inside we have uh, the, the the live neutral and earth for each one of these uh, circuits and, and each one can be isolated or turned on and off so there would be a, a switch here that's that one's on this one's off we've got a thing here called an rcd which is a residual current device which is a a method of protecting a, a circuit so that if it gets um, interrupted it won't uh, it will turn off automatically when it, when it senses that interruption 
So um, if you are mowing the lawn and you happen to go through the cable, it'll turn the power off, it'll, it'll sense that, uh, that that's happened, it'll turn the, the power off to that circuit. And then there's a master switch over the, the other side there which turns the whole thing off. One of the systems that's becoming more popular for electrical is solar um, PV, so that's photovoltaic cells. That's a way of producing electricity from the sun's energy. And these are usually roof-mounted panels or um, integrated into the, the, the roof surface, so they can be actual tiles that, that do the, the weather protection as well. Um, for the most part, they're, they're roof-mounted panels, and they're, they're mounted on a series of brackets that sit uh, onto the roof, and uh, that would still allow water to, to drain down underneath the, the, the panels. Most systems are about four kilowatts. So they produce electricity as, as DC, so that's direct current, the same current that you would get from a, from a battery. Um, it, it constantly flows in one direction, if you like, and uh, but that needs to be changed into alternating current, which is the, the current that we, that we would use in, uh, in our houses. So the, the, the kind of simplify it a little bit, the flow of electricity basically flip-flops from one direction to the other, or one, one cycle to the, the next, and uh, becomes an alternating current at a, a rate, I think it's 50 hertz. So we have to change power from photovoltaic to, um, from DC to AC. So we need a thing called an inverter, which changes DC to AC. The location of photovoltaic on a building is is because we're in the northern hemisphere here, uh, we have south-facing uh, sunshine, uh, or sunshine from the south. And if you think back to the, uh, the lecture on orientation and location, where we talked about the maximum sun angle, probably round about where we are, um, a 30 degree roof is probably best for being able to collect a maximum amount of light um, onto a roof. Now, because they're, they're a single system, if we uh, have anything overshadowing the system, uh, such as trees or adjacent buildings, that can uh, affect the amount of power being output from it. Um, so when you're assessing a building for a PV system, they would probably look at um, a kind of solar map for the, for the whole of the year, looking at the, the surroundings. It's not just as easy as saying, yes, that building can have it. You need to be able to calculate whether there's any overshadowing. And these systems can work as either grid connected or off grid. If it's grid connected, then we can have a, a, a generation meter so we can figure out how much we've actually generated and then that can be offset against the supply meter. Um, it's sometimes told, sometimes said that excess energy is sold back to the national grid. It's not quite true, um, you're probably always going to use more electricity from the grid than you would produce in the house. It's very rare that would be negative. So it's usually um, two meters, one, one running backwards and one running forwards, and your, um, your electricity bill would effectively be the difference between them. If it's off-grid, it needs to be put into a series of batteries to be stored for, for later use. The inverter um, is usually a kind of a box like this with a couple of control switches. Um, so we're taking the, the DC power into the inverter and that then changes it to AC. And on large units, there's usually one for about every four kilowatts, most domestic um, supply, uh, but most domestic PV installations are about four kilowatt peak. Um, so you would have one or two of these inverters for that. For larger systems, you would divide it up so you would have different numbers of inverters for, for different subparts of the system. And we need to find space within the building to actually accommodate these. So if we look at a typical photovoltaic um, installation or a diagram of an installation, we have uh, down in the bottom, bottom corner here, we've got our power coming into the, the property and that's measured by this uh, supply meter, so that's the, the, the equivalent of your electricity meter in the, in the house. And 
once that's uh, been been measured as the demand, it goes into our uh, consumer unit for distribution. So that can go off and uh, feed our, our TV or make the lights bright and uh, in the normal normal way. On the roof we have our solar panels which are then passed through the inverter which is uh, located in the loft, changes it into AC power which is then passed down towards the consumer unit and uh, is measured on the way. So we've got our, our generation meter on, on that side and it's the consumer unit that effectively distributes the power regardless of whether it's coming from uh, the mains in that direction or coming from the PV in that direction. And there would be no difference because it's all AC systems um, to how any of the power for appliances is actually um, utilised. One important consideration for photovoltaic is that um, where you are in the world affects how much power you can produce. Um, so if you remember back to the location ones, we were talking about the, the further north you are, the, the less light that uh, you receive, and light is power. It's a uh, so, uh, global horizontal irradiation it's, it's measured as. And we can see that um, in the, the, the north of Scotland and the, the, the islands, it's significantly less than it would be down in Cornwall. So another system for producing power um, off-grid or on-grid is uh, wind. Most small wind turbines require a speed of 5 metres per second for operation. Any lower than that, there's not enough power to be able to turn the, the, the blades effectively. They can be affected by turbulent air. So we, if we have objects around about them, or buildings or walls or high trees, um, it can be beneficial to either locate the turbine away from those trees or higher up above those trees to be able to um, produce constant uh, power from them. In the local vicinity of them we can get some noise and um, they, are, they are quite noisy and you'll hear the, the blades cutting through the air so that's a consideration for um, providing uh, a nuisance to, to any properties that are nearby. The energy production is similar to PV. If you're grid connected, then you can have a, um, a generation meter and effectively you can sell your power back to the national grid um, with a couple of protections on the system. Um, that's possible. Off grid, again, we're storing things in, in batteries for, for later use. So there's a, a diagram here um, which talks about uh, the kind of turbulence that you can get around buildings and, and uh, trees and normally what happens with the, the pressure differences for, for wind coming back um, we might get a wind flow over the top of a building and then there's negative pressure at the, the back which effectively pulls the, the flow of air back down and the same thing would happen round uh, round trees. So the little note here um, zone, zone of turbulence rises as the flow progresses downstream uh, if the obstacle is a building, then it shouldn't block the prevailing wind because it'll it'll push over the top. If you have a block of trees near the site, then you may find better wind above the trees than away from them. So actually, if we have our uh, turbine, we might be better um, having it higher up if it's if it's close to trees. And again, we have mapping available for wind speed um, in the same way that we had for photovoltaic and you can see that the, the, the opposite is almost true that um, where we reach the, the, the top of Scotland and the west coast uh, we get uh, quite significant wind speeds. If we go down to um, the, the southeast of England we get um, a lot less. So it's important to understand whereabouts you are before you start to specify a, a micro wind turbine. Um, it's also important to note that local conditions can have a significant impact. We can have hills and trees and uh, buildings and built up areas that can cause problems with, with wind. So regardless of where you are in this map, there, that might not be a consistent site, a consistent measure of the, the maximum wind speed. Drainage is um, 
the sort of black art of of uh, construction. It's it's one of these things that um, you can read about in books until you actually see it on site. It doesn't actually make sense. But effectively, what we're trying to do with drainage is is take the wastewater from um, toilets and sinks and basins and showers and uh, remove it from from the building. Um, but also equalise pressure with it within the system that uh, is required to do that. And the main um, element to, to most drainage systems um, is called a soil and vent pipe or an SVP. So that would be this pipe here. So it's taking the soil away down in that direction and it's allowing air into the top um, at the top to be able to pressurise the system. And most soil and vent systems require on a series of uh, require a series of uh, traps um, to be able to stop any foul gas from uh, entering the system. So if you look underneath your sink or your uh, basin what you'll see is uh, what used to be commonly known as a, a U-bend um, or it might be one of the uh, slightly different type of trap, you might not be actually be able to see this shape, but effectively it's doing this within it. And uh, when you uh, run water through the sink, what happens is it forms a, a level across itself and uh, gives a water seal. So any, any kind of gases that are coming up through the, the system can't uh, get back up through the, the, the plug hole and, and cause a smell. Sometimes if you go to um, very warm countries, um, if showers haven't been used for a while or uh, toilets haven't been used for a while there's sufficient evaporation of this water to to remove it to remove that water seal so you tend to find there's a bit of a stink in the in the houses and when we're designing uh, soil and vent systems it's important to think about how much water is actually going through them um, at any time so a typical toilet will discharge um, up to about 1.7 litres per second and if we go down to something like a, a, a urinal or a dishwasher that's a very small amount of water that's passing through it. So in general the large amount of water can, can flush the system um, at a greater distance so we'd have smaller distances for things like uh, wash basins or um, ba uh, wash basins or showers to the main stack than we would for items with higher flow. So we can see a diagram here of a, a soil and vent system. Um, so the main thing to note is that all soil and vent systems re rely on air pressure to drain the systems correctly. If we didn't have um, air entering into the, the top there, we would get a, a form of siphon. So if you imagine getting a drinking straw and putting it into, into water. If you put your thumb over the top of it and lift it up, there's no air pressure in the top of the straw to be able to push the, the liquid out. Um, as soon as you release your thumb, air pressure, air can rush into the top, equalize the pressure, and the water would, would fall out. And it's no different for, for a soil and vent system. So we've got a couple of different ways to be able to get air into the system. We can either um, take the, the, the pipe through the roof or we can install uh, an air admittance valve, which is sometimes called a Durgo valve. It's exactly the same thing. And working our way downwards towards the, the, the drains, we have a number of different pipes of different sizes. We've usually got a 110 or 100 millimeter pipe for, for a toilet, um, and we would have 40 millimeter pipe or 32 millimeter pipe for, for other smaller appliances. And if we're taking this uh, SVP, um, so it's SVP there, which is a soil and vent pipe, that bit there. And I'm really just circling that because you might need to know that term for, uh, you know, a future assessment. I'll give you a clue there. Um, if it's taken through the roof, we need to be able to block the hole that um, that it's come through. So you get this this system where you get a flexible boot and uh, a metal flashing and the tiles would be installed underneath that um, so that any water would be able to run down over the top of that flashing 
and uh, find its way onto the roof. And we have a little cage at the top there just to stop uh, birds and other things getting into the, the, the pipe system. So the air admittance valves work in a particular way when the, the valve opens um, because the, the water wants to run downwards there's a, there's a negative pressure that happens within the, the pipe and there's a, a diaphragm within the, the air admittance valve which then reacts to that negative pressure, pulls up and air can then come in from the, the space to uh, equalise the pressure. Once the pressure is equalised, the valve closes. So there's no possibility of smells getting out of the pipe into, into the space. And when the soil and vent pipe uh, reaches the, the ground, so here's our, our SVP coming down, usually what we, we have is a number of um, access chambers or manholes that uh, connect into to different systems. So with a combined system where we've got um, our soil and vent waste, our toilet and uh, wash hand basins and the, the kind of foul water uh, joined to our surface water, which is uh, rainwater pipes at that point, we would combine those within a, a manhole. The manholes are usually preformed plastic chambers with a number of different inlets into them to take a number of pipes that can then direct all off in one direction. So in conclusion, um, services within a building have their own technical requirements. We need to understand electrical systems to be able to specify them. Um, we need to be able to understand what renewables are. And there have been different trades that have been developed up over, over time. So electricians and plumbers are the trades that are most likely to be concerned with um, domestic services. So regardless of whether a project is on-grid or off-grid, the systems within the building run in a similar way. So the electrical systems are distributed in the same way, whether it's photovoltaic or whether it's uh, normal mains electricity. And the drainage system within the building would run the same, whether it was a septic tank system or a, a mains drainage system. So aspects that you should take from this lecture are that drainage systems require to be trapped to stop uh, foul gases entering the, the house. That PV systems require inverters to change DC to AC. That soil and vent systems require ventilation to equalise pressure. And that heating systems tend to work indirectly to heat radiators and hot water. Okay, that is the end of the lecture series for AC 1002. Um, I hope it's been some use, of you, use for you. Um, please let me know if you've got any comments or questions. Thank you very much.